Hi guys. Uh, no, good afternoon. So uh, thank you so much to be here today. I am so happy we have an artist here that is Nano Stern with us. <laughs> and his musicians. So yeah, we're going to begin with where you want. Thank you. Question, uh, someone doesn't speak Spanish. <laughs> okay, I will speak in English then. Yeah, todo lo demás. Yeah, we respect minorities. <laughs> Vamos. And uh, of course, it's such a big uh, privilege for us to be here. You grow up wherever you grow up, as you all know. Of course, you listen Berkeley School of Music. Huh? We tried to get in, but we didn't get in. Now we get invited. <laughs> Suena, no? En las cartas de la borra del café Le pregunto a los maestros En un ciego acto de fe Me doy mil quinientas vueltas Pero aún no sé qué hacer Mientras más preguntas hago Menos logro responder Busco indicios en los cielos No sé si algo va a pasar Le pregunto a las estrellas Por si hay algún plan astral Y no tengo ni un mapa para seguir No tengo ni una coordenada Ni una brújula que diga dónde ir Oh no, cómo seguir Yo quisiera que la vida misma me muestre el camino Que hacerme mare y pierdo el rumbo, cambiando de parecer. Cinco indicios en las cartas de la borra del café. Le pregunto a los maestros en un ciego acto de fe. Me doy mil quinientas vueltas, pero aún no sé qué hacer. Mientras más preguntas hago, pero logro responder. Busco indicios en los cielos, no sé si algo va a pasar. Le pregunto a las estrellas por si hay algún plan astral. Y no tengo ni un mapa para seguir. No tengo ni una coordenada. Ni una brújula que diga dónde ir. Oh no, cómo seguir. Quisiera que la vida misma me muestre el camino. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Okay. Pase por favor. Bueno. So, can you talk? Can you talk about your beginning in the music? Mm -hmm. So, I was uh, I was lucky because I grew up in a music family. My both my grandfathers were 
uh, musicians, my, from my father's side, very bad musician, uh, <laughs> violin player, very out of tune. I think I inherited from him this side. Mm -hmm. And from my mother's side, a more semi-professional accordion player. And they were both immigrants. They were uh, Jewish people escaping from the war in mm -hmm. Europe, from different countries, different traditions, and, uh, but they had in common this music. And uh, I think the, neither my parents are musicians, and they are very untalented in music, but my sister got this. So she's uh, a lot older than me, 13 years older, and I grew up very young listening to my grandfather, one of them who was alive, with the accordion, and my sister with the guitar playing uh, already some other kind of music, listening to Silvio Rodriguez, listening oh, cool, to yeah. Victor Jara, listening mm -hmm. to the, the great... A, uh, sorry. It, uh, Victor Jara is a, is a folk music from Chile for our country. Yeah, it's yeah. like the great uh, song songwriting tradition of Latin America. No? So I was uh, influenced from all these angles. Mm -hmm. And then... In parallel to this, I was uh, obsessed for some reason with, with the violin. I don't know why, because the grandfather who played violin had died many years before I was born. Mm -hmm. But my mom recognized whenever the radio there was classical music, I was like, oh. and she took me to orchestra when I was three, a, sh a concert, and I saw the violin, and I said, this, I, apparently, I don't remember, no? but she says, this is what I want to do all my life. And when they asked me, what do you want to be? I didn't want to be a, a firefighter or an astronaut. I want to be a violin player. And uh, ever since, and then it was just continue. Going cool, on. Yeah. cool, cool. So then, what happened? You know, you began with the violin. Mm -hmm. You take classes of violin. Yeah, I did the Suzuki method. Suzuki method. All the way. Yeah, and uh, I was really lucky because I s I was in the first generation. Can of you Chile. explain about the yeah. Suzuki method? Some some of you have done Suzuki here. A couple of you. Yeah. So how many of you have no idea what I'm talking about Suzuki method? Okay, yeah, Suzuki yeah, method is a brilliant. <laughs> incredible advance, I would say, in the way that you teach music to, to little children, because uh, this guy, Suzuki, the, the Japanese violin player, he won a scholarship, like many of you, I guess, to play in the Berliner Philharmonic, you know? so probably the best classical orchestra in the world, and he went all proud, you know, great player, doctor in violin, and, uh, and there he was, living in Berlin, and after three years, uh, says the story, that uh, at for the other Suzuki students, this is the Chilean version. I don't know if it got <laughs> distorted, but the story I was told, you know, that after a couple of years living in Berlin, the guy couldn't learn German, and he was desperate. Like, how come I cannot learn to speak this damn language? Uh, how can it be so difficult? And then one day, he apparently saw a little kid who was three years old mm -hmm. in, the, in the subway in Berlin who spoke already perfect, like every three-year-old kid who speaks perfectly any complicated language. And then apparently it was that he clicked and said, we should really learn from how little children learn to speak and learn their mother tongue, and we should apply that to music. And among the first things he realized is that uh, the traditional way of teaching, especially violin, which is this conservatory tradition, is that you would go there and the teacher or piano, they would put a sheet music in front of you, and they would say, this symbol is an A, and you play it like this, no? But if you take it and you make the parallel with language, it is like trying to teach a baby who doesn't know how to speak already to read, which makes absolutely no sense at all. It's complete absurd, no? So he said, okay, we're going to copy exactly how it is that you learn from your mother, your mother tongue. And it is through, for example, only positive reinforcement. I mean, when a little baby is starting to learn to speak and says something wrong, uh, can you imagine the parents would like hit him because you don't say it like that? Mm -hmm. No, it's totally cute and it's like, oh great, and it's so funny and they speak back to you with your mistakes and it's always positive and it's like you're learning, you're getting there, you're getting better and you're starting from zero. So all this applied into the process of music. So no reading until, like I didn't, I didn't even see a piece of sheet paper music until six or seven years nice. after yeah. I was starting to play. And, uh, and everything by ear, by ear, everything by repeating, by playing, you know, it's a very happy experience. So in, at that time, you, you, you listen a lot of different music. No? Yeah, especially classical music. And the method is developed in, in terms of getting more complex, more complex. So you start... Uh, uh, which is great, because it's a very well thought mm -hmm. uh, process of developing. And then it, it's really incredible uh, results, I mean, you see everyone who does it. It's not that you have to be super talented musician, nothing. Every kid that goes, if you continue in the method after four or five years, you are able to play a Bach violin concert by memory nice. without reading, without ever having read it. And you know the whole thing, and it's quite complex. And all these kids everywhere in the world playing this, this super beautiful, complicated music in a very natural way. So then, 
So then you begin in high school, like yeah. uh, another processing hormones, music? Hormones, hormones, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, yeah, this violin story, mm -mm, it's not the way, I should play guitar. So <laughs> <laughs> I started playing guitar with my sister and my, my brother-in-law, who was teaching me. But of course, I joined the band in the school, and I was the younger one of all. So the older kid, uh, who was also playing Suzuki violin, very good musician, uh, he played guitar a little bit better than I, because he was three years older. So I was, of course, in the position that I had to be the bass player. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I was, <laughs> so I was uh, forced out of the guitar and into the bass. But in the end, it was the best thing that could happen for me because it opened my mind to complete different music. And after one or two years playing bass, I started going like, okay, like listening to Led Zeppelin a lot and then John Paul Jones and the tradition of playing. And then, of course, wanting to do more and then Jaco Pastorius. And mm -hmm. then through, actually, through being the lesser guitar player and playing bass, I entered the world of jazz, really, because I understood well. And this music the bass is really important it's doing cool not just like mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah so <laughs> <laughs> so time. so th that's how it opened uh, a complete different uh, aspect of music and when do you decide be a musician i never decided it was completely clear from the yeah so apps. you never you never think about that as i said when i was three years old i wanted to be a violin player and then it just it's changed no? like but a natural absolutely yeah. and then so then yeah at one point i started playing in more professional bands and i met christian we we met in school we, we had the same teacher in different schools. I was in the oh, rich cool. school, and he was in the smart school, <laughs> <laughs> elite school, El Instituto Nacional. Oh, yeah. So we had the same teacher, Nacional and he, he, he sort of uh, made a match there. And still, here we are 20 years after touring Boston. Cool. Aguante. <laughs> and then after playing in, in rock bands and uh, being the youngest by far with people 20 years older and mo much more experienced, I went to the conservatory in Chile, mm -hmm. same as you. Yeah. Actually, we were... We didn't know, but we just yeah. found out we were going <laughs> we to the same school at the yeah. same time. And I did two years of composing contemporary mm. music. Yeah. And I hated the guts out of it. it why, you, why you hate? Because it was full of st stuck up people saying bullshit and believing that the actual, the main teacher of the thing said, it doesn't matter if you like the music you make. And I was so far away from this whole trip. You know? Nevertheless, I learned a lot. I met great yeah. people. and and. And indirectly, I, I got involved with the early music. So I got much more into that side. I studied a little bit viola da gamba and, mm -hmm. and learned repertoire and, uh, and polyphonic singing and all these other experiences. And also the contemporary, uh, the beauty of it. I mean, even if your teachers are assholes, you know, you get to listen yeah. to this incredible, you know, I don't know, Messien and Penderecki and, yeah. and music that I would never heard otherwise. But at, at the time, you are like listening a lot of contemporary music. Yeah. When did you come back to the popular music in some way, folk, folk yeah, music. Because at some point, uh, I I started in the Catholic University, like you, mm -hmm. which is one of the two good good schools there for formal education. And uh, we were forced to take a subject that was religious. Mm -hmm. no? as, a, as, one, as a free subject, it has to be one in the religion. So I was completely, of course, not going to take like Jesus or something away. And I took uh, Eastern Thought with a great wise man from Chile called Gaston Sublet, maybe the Chileans, you know him. And he was uh, reading his own translation from Chinese of the Tao Te Ching. Mm. And so it was a very profound experience at 19 to read this book. And it gave me the complete certainty. I said, I'm losing my time in this school. I have to get out here as soon as I can. So I sold everything that I had except one guitar and I bought a ticket to Germany, which was the country of my grandparents, wow. of one side. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, of course, the Nazis and the whole trauma, no one wants to go back. But I said, it's important for me to discover my history. Where do I come from? What is this trip? So I left. And uh, of course, leaving there, I got into touch with the Chilean musicians. And the the your land, sort of, I imagine it happens to everyone here. You leave your country, and then your country is much more of your identity. No, If you are a musician, a Chilean musician in Chile, and they say, who are you? You say, I'm a musician. But if you are somewhere else, you say, I am a Chilean musician. No? So you're, and I was lucky to be received by an important band in the, in the history of Chilean popular mm -hmm. folk music who had to live with the exile in the 70s. So they received me, and I learned. I was already involved in, in uh, Ortiga, they are okay. called. They are yeah. descendants from Quilapayún. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was already playing in those rock bands. I was playing charango and kena and the folk instruments. I was into it through Los Jaivas, a rock band. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's a long other story. But, but being far away made me really start to understand and to search for my own, Your own music, my own yeah. music, which is also for me a double negative sort of. I'm 
grandchildren of immigrants. So what is my own? I have no fucking clue. You know, it's something in ether around. Cool. So I had to make it up. <laughs> you like to play another song? Sure. And then absolutely. We continue. Absolutely. And I will introduce it a little bit because it has so much to do with all what we just talked. It's a song called Festejo de Color. And uh, to start, it's written, the text is written in decimas. I don't know if you know what is decimas, but it's a very, very traditional uh, way of writing poetry that came from Spain and is present all over Latin America in every tradition from, from poetry, but also in song. And the beauty about it is that you, you can hear the same text or the same kind of text, exact same structure being put to music in infinite different beautiful ways. No? So uh, it's a song that speaks about migration, uh, starting about my own grandparents, my personal story, but transcending also because nowadays, I mean, we live in a world in which we are all migrants, no? somehow. And uh, the rhythm of the song is interesting. Tocando el riff un poquito? So listen to, we, we introduce it and when, then we play the whole thing. Vamos un poquito, mira. Okay, so you get the, the beat of it. Which bit? Which bit? Que compas? Which uh, time signature would you say? Seven? Three, four? Que nada más? Five, seven, three, four, six, four. What else? <laughs> okay, you're all right, actually. And this is where it gets very funky, and this is something that is opens really your way of listening to it. So actually, I would say it's 12-8, yeah, which is a favorite rhythm of, of, of Afro-descending music no? all, all over the world, and especially in Latin America. So 12-8, you can count as 6, no, 6-4. Six, you can count also as 3-4. You can count as 4-4 four, four also. But, and here comes the, 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 I think, what I was adding from my own personal story, considering that the song is about my roots, which are Central and Eastern European, you can also count seven as an addition of five, sorry, count 12 as an addition of five and seven. So you get one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, yeah, or both together, no? Or you can get one two three one two one two three one two one two one two three one two one two three one two one two and if you count like this it's a very Balkan boom no? completely Balkan, completely Eastern Turkish and then to Persia and beyond, no? But you can put all together. And if you count, and you're, if you get to the point where you can listen to five plus seven on top of four and three, it's very funky. <laughs> and so this is what happens in this song, and it's called Festejo de Color. And uh, it's funny because we decided, first song we should play in this Berkeley workshop is this one. And on the way here, I realized that it's a song with, with a couple of guests on the record, and two out of three are alumni from here. So it's uh, bringing back home, this song. Se llama El Festejo de Color. Vamos acá. Llegaste desde otra tierra Dejando atrás una vida, partiendo sin despedida Y escapando de una guerra Cruzaste la cordillera Atravesaste el desierto o tal vez llegaste al puerto Sin saber lo que esperaba Lo cierto es que atrás quedaba El pasado con sus muertos es... Tan lejos está tu historia, sepultada por el tiempo que no le entrega ni al viento un pedazo de memoria. Nunca buscaste la gloria, ni imaginaste el futuro, pero en aquel viaje duro que te trajo a este lugar, la vida empezó a brotar como la letra en el muro. Celebró la diferencia y el festejo de color y te doy la bienvenida con cariño y con fervor 
Que se junte nuestra voz, se parte en hasta una canción Y se trece nuestros pueblos en una sola nación A ver, la 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 Trajiste casi nada en tu equipaje pequeño Pero bien guardado un sueño desembarco en tu llegada Un suspiro, una mirada, un acento medio extraño Un vestido hecho de paño y el cantar del acordeón Quedan en el corazón por más que pasen los años Se viste de colores, nuestra tierra engalanada para celebrar tu llegada y alejarte los dolores Y a tu paso crecen flores Que entremezclan las raíces de todos esos países Que en tu ruta se han unido Y que el tiempo ha convertido en telar de mil matices Celebro la diferencia y el festejo del color Y te doy la bienvenida con y con fervor que se junte nuestra voz se que hasta una canción y se trece nuestro pueblo a ver claro cantando con nosotros Gracias, Pato Rojas y Cristian Carbacho. Nice. It was so cool that you said six, three, five, seven, everything at once. One. The mic. Ah, sorry. Okay. It doesn't okay. Happen, <laughs> so. This is a low, pro, low budget school. <laughs> So, when we think right now about the music in Latin America, some people said, you know, you are one of the ambassadors of the music in Latin America. Mm. And it's really interesting because in some way, is you know, like really young people, uh, like um, um, Pascuala, mm -hmm. you, you know, you are making music that, that is, is not like a pure music, like a pure folk music. It's, it's, it's a mix of different music from Latin America influential from Indian music. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about that? I think that is the way of the world. No? We are Latin American music with clear identities of where we come from, but also where we're going. And we grew up with, with, uh, with uh, Napster, no? like all of you. So uh, you could listen to folk music of Rajasthan if you want in one click, and then you could listen to Ice-T in one click, and whatever you want. And this is the reality where we live. So I think uh, 
the challenge now is really not to not not to mix the fusion fusion is, is a thing of, of of another generation perhaps that it was the big deal like oh we play fusion and we put together different things and then comes this most hated of concept by me really which is world music mm -hmm. which is the most imperialistic and fascist concept that you can ever think of because what is world music anything that is not in english and that is not commercial pop music of the style that is produced here and in england mm -hmm. everything else falls into one comfortable category, you know? Yeah. And many times I'm labeled and we go to world music festivals and we work with world music presenters and really it feels so wrong, you know? So the challenge is not to produce this, this fusion. I think we are open people. The challenge is really now a little bit inward, you know? Yeah. And, and going back to the 90s and when all these concepts were either created or made uh, massive, you had this phrase, I'm sure we all heard it and said it many times, like uh, think, was it? Think, come say I confuse. It. Think global, and act locally. So I completely disagree. I mean, I agree, but also I think it's our challenge now to think locally and act globally. We should also be aware of the, the implications of thinking globally. You know, no, not everything is thinking globally because global is also a very politically manipulated term. Yeah. No. So we should also be able to think of our communities. And in our case, we are lucky because we are here today with you, and tomorrow we're in Canada, and in one week in Spain. So we can actually act globally, mm -hmm. you know, and think locally, and present our local uh, reality to a global reach. And this is a big privilege, and it's also a big responsibility. I think. And do you think it, that is the reason because the people like their music? I guess it speaks from somewhere that is honest to myself, you know, it's true to me and if it's true to yourself then it touches other people, I think there is no other secret. If you are putting together a bullshit story on stage, as w good as it is, it can be the best technical level, the best production, the m best light and costume, but if it's not true what you're doing, then people are not going to buy it, you know. Oh, cool. Uh, I think. Uh, um, some question, guys? We have a time to have some question too. No se yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I can, I can uh, go with the microphone. So. <laughs> My guitar is also so you can change it for a new one. <laughs> if you have one there, spare. Um, I have a question about the lyric writing. Yeah. How do you, uh, how do you work with that? Do you, do you always come up with the with lyrics first or the music first, or how is that like uh, process of like getting it all together? Because it. It sounded almost like the the lyrics were. I know that you you said that that was like a specific like poem form, yeah. but in the other song too, and in your other songs, it seems like the lyrics are with the clave, like they're both on, on the same page, like in meaning and in sound. So yeah. I wanted to ask you about that. I don't have a method like first one then the other, both, no. And very very once in a while, and it's the best they come together. It's like it's a m it's everything, you know. But it doesn't happen as often as I would like, of course. And but I think then the challenge is just to uh, either listen to the music of the words or read the words of the music, and they are implicit the whole time. No, for example, this last song that we played, it's it's not so often because I started with music and not with words, so mostly I write the music first. But in this case, I had this this decimas, no, these these words, and uh, I had them for like one year, and I s it didn't work, and I tried and this, and I had an intuition like where it was going, but it took a lot of work. Till like finally, and it was right on the spot. We had to record in two weeks or something. I was <laughs> on the last chance to put together stuff, and then boom, it came together. You know? And the and the the chorus of the song "Celebro la Vida" this was actually created on the spot all together because it sort of made sense. No? But s decimas, for example, and uh, this is something that I've been learning and still learning every day. You know, if you go to the tradition and you study the traditional forms. It be it dance, you know, or lyrics, or music, or whatever, or cooking, there is a reason, you know. It's not that the rules, someone said, I'm going to create a rule. It's rather, I think, that it's like evolution, you know. It's things that started staying, and they stayed from generation to generation. And it's the same with folk music. It's like, w in, in the end, folk songs, it's not like that created by Mr. Folk, you know. It's created by someone, but it's the greatest hits of the tradition. It's the songs that remain. The same with forms. So if you make decimas, there is a music in it, you know, and there's a million. And actually, by the way, you could play any lyrics of decimas with any song in decimas. So, uh, for example, you have Violeta Parra, famous, uh, 
Volver a los 17 Después de vivir un siglo But I could sing Se, eh, eh, Llegaste desde otra tierra Dejando atrás una vida Partiendo sin despedida Y escapando de una guerra Cruzaste la cordillera Atravesaste el desierto O tal vez llegaste al puerto Sin saber lo que esperaba Lo cierto es que atrás quedaba El pasado con sus muertos And so with any decimas in the world Jorge Drexler, for example, many songs Big hits, pop songs And this one uh, Yo soy un moro judío It's also in decimas, no? So many, except for these uh, chorus So it's a beautiful thing And, and uh, yeah, I think lyrics Music, lyrics, one thing. Uh, it's a beautiful marriage of the two combined. Other Question. pregunta? Sí. Do you guys only perform in the trio? Or do you, are there more people that... Uh, the, it depends on the budget. <laughs> Not really. Yeah, uh, it really depends on the budget. Uh, we have uh, the full band is seven people. Okay. But for big, big, big shows that we do a couple of times a year in our hometown, we have... The seven people plus guests plus string quartet, so it can be like 15 people all in once. And yeah. then uh, now we are touring overseas in another continent, so it's really impossible at this point to bring the whole band. So we have the trio. And then in other situations, for example, in two weeks, the guys leave home and I stay by myself and do some shows. And it's strictly a matter of being able to afford it. But I think always in, 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 uh, in the lack of resource comes uh, great things, no? Uh, yeah. Because Playing trio is not a decision. I said, oh, I would like to take less than half my band on the road. But it starts to grow into something really cool, and there's more space, and you have to develop a different way of playing. So it's really, I love it, actually. I think even if I had all the money in the world and I could take the symphony with me everywhere, no, nah, it's cool to change format, and to, it keeps you on the tip of your feet all the time. No? I'm sure you have more things to like bring back to the full band. Exactly. When you learn to take that space on your own. Huh? Absolutely, and actually, it's funny, because whenever we come back from a tour like this, and then we play the first gig back home with the band. We have new things and little breaks and tricks, and it's really tight, and the guys are like, yeah, cool. <laughs> and, but it's also logic, because the rest of the band is uh, cello, uh, uh, trumpet, and flugelhorn, a guy who plays violin and keyboard, and electric guitar. So it's kind of cosmetic in a way. You know? and it's it a don't lot. I don't say it in the wrong way, but it's like, this is really the beef. You know? This is the, the, the backbone. Yeah. The like this is what stands it, and basically this is, and then yeah. the extension that, and the extension. So it's really cool to, it's like uh, retiring, uh, going to the gym a little bit, the trio. You know, like you have to really work hard, and fill all that space and be creative on how to. I mean, I think we're we're every show we are getting a little bit better in terms of how do you play arrangements which are meant for seven people in three people. You know? Right. Uh, Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Come on. Yeah. Uh, hi, thank you hey. for being here first. Um, I would like to know who inspires you outside music and how can you manage to make the link so you can attribute that inspiration to, to your own music? Hmm. Good question. Did you get me out of my... Uh no, no, great. <laughs> who inspires me? Um... It's very hard to say one individual, no? I think it's more a concept that inspires me. This idea that music is able to transform people's lives no, in a positive way. This idea, I think this is what keeps me going and going and going the whole time. And, uh, and it's not music itself, you know? It's what, what can be achieved through the music. And uh, I remember very well, the, the after studying in Chile, I studied again in Amsterdam in the conservatory there which is much more like this, you know? It's more similar in every way, people from all the world, you know? And, and I remember being in this cloud of, of sort of self-reference, no? Of music and musicians. And not even music and musicians, but music and music students. And I think that like the whole s value system is completely wrong, you know? It's like you, you, of course, you immerse yourself into this world of developing your skills. And, and it's very competitive, and you look to the ne guy next, next to you, and it's sort of you admire him, but also you hate him because he does something better than you, you know? And it's all like this, and then all of a sudden, either in my case because you quit or because you finish, you get out of music school, and you realize, shit, music is a tool to communicate with human beings, you know? It's the most beautiful tool, perhaps, to achieve 
communion and to achieve a community. And so this is really what, what I, and it's a, it's a very spiritual, it's at the same time a spiritual thing and it's a, it's a political thing and it's a ce celebratory, I don't know what's it, festive opportunity, you know? So it's such a beautiful, great opportunity. This is motivation enough, you know, to, and I, I think Shostakovich or another old Russian composer, I think him, who said that, uh, how is it in English? Um, that uh, mus music is enough for all your life, but your life is not enough for all music. You know? So the, you'll never run out of, of uh, energy to keep exploring. And, and also, I mean, you learn one thing and each new thing that you learn, it seems to me that there's like 10 new pos directions that appear. So actually, it's a bit cliche, but it's true, I think. The more you learn, the more you realize that there's this immense world of beauty and possibilities out there. I have a question mm. that maybe is more personal, that <laughs> uh, but I was wondering if you can share with us uh, some moment or which has been like for you one of the worthy or best moment mm -hmm. and the one of or some of the hardest moment that you have faced in your career mm. as a musician. I think I could uh, summarize with the same moment. I, I wouldn't point out to one specific, but whenever you are, you have the feeling that you're killing it, no? Ah, we are rocking and you're touring in the world and playing big spaces and popular and people love what you do and everyone is kind. And at the same time, I think if you're gonna really live the life of touring around the world and doing this, you are sacrificing so much, you know, on a personal level. and. I have the intuition whenever it's going very good that also on the other side of the coin it's going very bad, you know? And it's very hard, I think, to balance. And there is very few, if, if at all, people that I know that I can say I, this is someone that I think you did both. So cool, it's so great, no? And it's difficult. So uh, my way of, of living my life is, I think, very out of balance because it's very intense in both directions. So like I, we go on the road and or we make an album and I completely close the door to the rest of the world and then the opposite, you know, it's like, oh, my myself as a human being and, 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 and it feeds off each other, you know, but at the same time, I have this terrible feeling that whenever I am developing on the one, I am living beside the other and it works both ways and it's really hard and right now, being here and all, it also happens, you know, like it's the best and it's the worst together. Cool. Some more questions? Yeah. Hi. Um, first of all, I just want to like, thank you guys so much for being here. I'm still like kind of shocked that like this is, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I came up, came down from, from my school in Vermont and it was like checking to see, I was like, I wonder where, like, where Nano's playing. And it was oh. like, it was like uh, Chile. And then I don't remember before, and then it was like Boston, and then like Canada, and then like Spain. And I was yeah. like, wow, I gotta get down. So I oh, thank you. Um, you came all the way. Yeah, we're coming to the show tonight. Um, By the way, excited. there's a show tonight for people who want to come. Please come. It's first time in Boston. It's in Villa, Villa Victoria, right? So if you if you are interested, talk to Don and Laurel who are sitting there and work with us. So yeah, um, I just wanted to see if see if you could talk a little bit about the the influence that like revolutionary music has had on on your own like ideas, I guess, on your own songwriting and uh, like revol revolutionary music in Chile. Because uh -huh. um, I know you you sort of, uh, like you attribute a lot of uh, like Victor Jara and, and a mm -hmm. lot of revolutionary like sort of folk folk um, singers and uh, Chilean folk singers. And I was wondering if you, like if you've ever written something that you've, you know, in the process you've been like, I hope this song kind of stirs something up politically or something or anything like that. But yeah. Yeah, well, there's a big tradition no, uh, where we come from. and. Uh, People like Victor Jara, they given their life because of because of believing strongly what they stand for, you know. And uh, it's a it's a reference that is always present, you know. It's very hard to to be blind towards it, you know. It's there, and it's your choice, you know. What you're gonna do? Are you gonna be just uh, giving into the system and trying to be the biggest rock star that you can, and just be neglect that there is a very unfair reality going on there, or are you gonna use whatever talents you were given and, and whatever possibilities you have through your education and through your work to spread some sort of message, you know? And for me, this decision has been absolutely clear all the time, because I've been also lucky to run into people who have made it very clear, you know? Like, you don't become an asshole, you know? You don't forget that there is a world besides the theater, besides the hall, besides the club where you are believing your ego trip, you know? 
And, uh, and having those reference so close makes it easier in a way, but also very difficult because it's, it's almost impossible. They, they, they get this, uh, this godlike uh, aura around them, no? But Victor Jara, in the end, he was a dude. He was a guy, and he fucked up many times. And then he was a great person and also an awful person. And we've been lucky to, to, to work together with people from that generation, you know, which is really the epic of the Chilean story so far was the 1970s. And then the exile and a lot of people were murdered and martyrized and turned into these heroes. But when you talk to people who actually were there working with them and still working and you get the chance to work with them, everything becomes much more real and, and more doable, you know. And, uh, and yeah, I've written songs that I say, I hope this song helps, you know. And, uh, and then comes some journalist and says, ah, oh, the voice of a generation, which is the biggest bullshit you could make up, because it's not. It's your own voice. You are speaking for yourself, and hopefully, maybe, it will affect people. But, but I think in this day and age where we live, uh, of so much information and so much misinformation as well, uh, you, we have too much... Uh, anthems going around that want to change the world and everything and really a simple song that speaks about something that happens to you on a human level on a personal level can be much more of a transformation uh, opportunity for everyone else than trying to you know Donald Trump is a master fucker you know no you can sing about your I sing about my grandparents for example you know and in doing so and singing about migration I can only do it really if I speak of my story of things that make sense, not of trying to, you know, the revolution, you know, call the Bolsheviks and burn down Berkeley. No, it's not, I don't think it's that day and age that we live in, you know? and it would feel a little bit imposed to do it like that. Thanks for coming so far from Vermont. Um, this is kind of a two question in one. Um, did you ever thought that uh, uh, singing in Spanish would be kind of a a barrier for spreading your your music and uh, also when you perform around the world uh, do you have a certain kind of audience that you want to go uh -huh. or not so uh, the singing in Spanish was really I didn't sing at all at first and when I got to Germany I had to make a living and the first days I had no nothing else than to play in the street so I started playing guitar and making some tunes and stuff and I started singing out of necessity because I realized or I sing or I starve. You know? the playing guitar, no one cares, so they just walk by. And I said, well, I'm gonna sing the songs that I know and that I like to sing. And, uh, and ever since then it was clear, like I'm gonna sing in my language. And I've been, I've been not tempted by myself in, in terms of, oh, if I sing in English, you know, that's a broader audience, but I've been, I've been uh, sort of very unpolitely hinted in that direction by many people, other people, no management and the people in labels and they say, oh, you speak English, you know, very good and it would be so easy, just make a couple of songs in English, see what happens. But nah, it, it's, it feels that I would be doing it for the wrong reasons, you know. And once I had in my repertoire a song in English and I found the most obscure 16th century English folk song that I could find that spoke to me and sang that, no? But otherwise, I think, I think I'm a little bit uh, traumatized myself with this idea of not giving in, not, you know, not giving in to this, if I sing in English, I'm gonna make more money, you know, kind of. Uh, and also, we are lucky because it's not like I'm singing in Mapungun, you know, or singing in Basque or some obscure, Spanish is the third or second most widely spoken language in the world, so why not? It's also in, in, in terms of where you stand politically in the world, you say, I sing in my language. You know? And I'm happy to join other people and sing, but my songs, I'm not going to translate them consciously because it's going to be more commercial in the US. You know? And I don't think, actually, I don't think it would be, actually, because there's so many amazing good songwriters here that write in English as their mother language, so why would I, you know? I can try, but <laughs> and uh, the other pregunta? Um, if you think about uh, a certain type of audience ah. when you play around the world, not really, not really. And what I hate the most is when uh, when a show is only like Chilean expats living somewhere. Only that. It's great that there is some, no. But when it's like only the Chilean community in New Zealand or wherever, I hate it because it's for that I stay home, you know. And also, it's like communities abroad always they become very stiff and very kind of attached to this is not how the song goes it, because I listened to the record of Inti Mani a million times and you blaspheme you're changing the you know and this is complete stupidity I think so I 
I appreciate really playing for different people, as different as possible, and it's a good challenge always. Like, like, and we were just talking last night, remembering, like, for example, sometimes it plays uh, wrong, you know, and, and I completely don't get it. And I had a gig two years ago or something in San Antonio, in Texas, and the whole crowd was Mexicans, but they were all kind of extreme right-wing Republican Mexicans. And I didn't get it. I, I, I still don't get it, you know? And the show was crap because I couldn't connect to them. I didn't know how to... Well, I thought, what are these people? I mean, how can they think like that? And, and everything I said was like against to who they were, you know? So sometimes it plays back to me. <laughs> it fires back. <laughs> uh, I just had a more simple question about writing. I was wondering if you sort of, when you write music, do you treat it kind of like a discipline where you like assign yourself uh, a time throughout the, like throughout the day where you just kind of sit down with the guitar and work on songs even if you know you're not sure that you're getting anywhere with a certain song or if rather you kind of just you know you mess around and if something comes to you that's when you try and write or uh -huh. what's yeah so a bit of the of both you know i try and play as much as i can at home which is not so much you know unfortunately like i would say my job really uh i mean i'm full time dedicated to this but my job is more about the email of the tour and this and the interview and the meeting about the project in six months and that's really keeping busy all the time and I wish I had more time to just sit home and create no? but I don't so I play at night and sometimes something cool oh I like this and it goes on but more and more I have to take not like a time of the day but actually a time of the year and say okay this month I'm gonna go away I'm gonna turn my phone off leave my computer home and just concentrate on that no? because it takes me also a couple of days before anything really that makes any sense comes out and uh, I just did it for example I went and recorded a, an EP six new songs uh, all on the spot like playing everything and just making up everything writing lyrics music everything producing and it was really cool experience to, to focus because otherwise I cannot get into the spiritual place to, to do it thank you I'm super excited for the show tonight <laughs> <laughs> see but yeah El micrófono que tiene que quedar grabado. Um, you, you were talking that you were you were abroad, you studied abroad, and then uh, when you were abroad, like the music from your country started like to resonate in you, and I feel like exactly the same way. So, and this is I'm experiencing something really weird now, and I want to ask if you, uh, whenever I go home though, although I'm singing all these folk songs and I'm singing all this clave stuff and samba, and mm -hmm. I'm from Argentina, uh, I still feel a bit foreign there too. Like I like um, while I'm here, I'm always you know uh, studying these things and like going back to my roots. My grandparents come from Eastern Europe too, yeah. and then whenever I go back, I don't quite feel it, like that's my place either. Mm. Yeah, me neither. I don't think I will e ever feel that one place is like the home. No, but I think you just have to find your home in yourself. Yeah, that's not doesn't relate to a physical place. No, and there was. I mean, I, I've been, I have the privilege and the, the luck and many circumstances that determine that I've been successful in Chile and I'm famous there and, and way beyond the music scene. So there's million assholes that are saying their opinion about me everywhere. No? And of course, many of them is a negative and it's a very resented uh, story. You know? Especially also I have to deal personally with the fact of coming from a Jewish family, which in South America is a, it's a different than the US. And, uh, and many f factors that imply that there will be some asshole always trying to make me remember, like, hey, your grandparents are not from here, so don't you come sing this folk music, no? But this is it's complete Id idiotic, no? It's absolute bullshit. And you have to be strong about whatever feels right to you. And do it in a way that is honest also. I'm not going to go around the world putting on a poncho and playing indigenous music and, and, not, and not saying, listen, this is my story, you know? I've been lucky to be born here and have this connection to this tradition, but but also I am an individual with a with an individual story. And and I insist, going back to your question before, if you are able to be honest with that, then it's all good. If not, you're gonna be insecure. And also I'm very insecure many times, no, because it's uh it's it's it sucks a little bit being in this in the middle situation. And you will always be probably sorry <laughs> for the unhappy answer. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we are running on time. So, thank you guys uh, th first to be here with thank us. You. Thank you to Oscar Estanaro. Thank you, Victor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Welcome.
So I would like to say, yeah, thank you guys. Thank you, your musician. Can, can you present your musician? Sí. Yeah, yeah. On the bass, from Santiago de Chile, Patricio Rojas. And on the drum set, percussions, and charango, you will see Cristian Carvacho. So yeah, thank you so much. This is a big pleasure for us uh, to present music like from Chile, musician from Chile. And thank you so much to be here, guys. And see you next time. And yeah? see you tonight. Please yeah. come to the show. We need to sell tickets. <laughs> uh, we play a uh, suite now, two songs together from the folk tradition. So you get a taste of, of music from where we come from. The first one from uh, Quilapayun, uh, very, very important and famous folk band from Chile. And uh, then a uh, very personal interpretation of a folk song from Peru, from Ayacucho, up in the Andes Mountains, called Son Coyay, which is an indigenous word in Quechua, which means my sweetheart, little heart, but sweetheart. And uh, I don't know how he does it, but Christian plays drums and charango simultaneously, which I will always be amazed <laughs> at him. Usted manda. summer in Chile. Folk music. ¿Está sonando el violín? ¿Son? ¿Ya? Momento, momento. Esta se llama, es como La Ventolera, The Wind. ¿Cómo se dice? The wind rush, the wind. Uh, the wind.
Tú eres como las palomas, son joya y que bajan a beber. Tú eres como las palomas, son joya y que bajan a beber agua. Después de beber el agua, son joya y alzan el vuelo y se van. Después de beber el agua, son joya y alzan el vuelo y se van. Yo te quise con el alma, son Goya y tú no has sabido quererme. Yo te quise con el alma, son Goya y tú no has sabido quererme. Y el amor que yo te tuve, son Goya y conforme vino y se fue. El amor que yo te tuve, son Goya y conforme vino y se fue. Corazón, corazón, pobrecito mi corazón Tú no más tienes la culpa corazón De haberla querido tanto corazón Corazón, corazón, pobrecito mi corazón Tú no más tienes la culpa corazón De haberla querido tanto corazón Thank you so much. I'll see you around. Gracias por invitarnos. Gracias, Víctor. Muchas gracias, Berkeley. Cristian Carvacho, Pato Roja, gracias. Okay.